and analysis of knowledge and valuation by Charles Irving Lewis a work of epistemology and philosophy of value published 1946 the principal ideas are that empirical statements describing matters of fact are equivalent in meaning to hypothetical statements to the effect that if one were to act in a certain way then one would come to have experiences of a certain anticipated sort an empirical statement is verified by finding out whether what is presented in experience as a result of action is what one would expect a priori statements statements whose truth is independent of matters of fact are true by virtue of the meanings of their terms and the logical relations between terms value statements concerning objects are empirical statements to the effect that if one were to be concerned with the objects one would be satisfied or pleased by them value statements expressive of the value quality of experience do not admit of error and therefore unlike value statements concerning objects cannot be known to be true C. I. Lewis undertook an examination of the basic topics in ethics in preparation for the Carus lectures the seven series to be delivered in 1945 but during the course of his philosophical inquiries he came to realize that problems of value take semantical priority over problems of moral rightness and duty and that epistemological considerations having to do with the knowledge of values would have to come before further reflections on value the problem for him became the problem of determining whether knowledge of values is possible the conclusion he reached is that such knowledge is possible the defense of his conclusion is this present work an analysis of knowledge and valuation the book begins with a pragmatic account of knowledge to know he argues at the outset is to apprehend the future as qualified by values which action may realize this theory of knowledge owes its basic character to Peirce and James William James statements describing matters of fact whatever their grammatical form are equivalent in meaning to hypothetical statements to the effect that if one were to act in certain ways then one would come to have experiences of the sort anticipated a statement is verified by acting and finding out whether what one receives in the way of experience is what one expected for example this wall is hard if I should bump my head against it it would hurt knowledge action and evaluation are connected because knowledge is understandable only in terms of action one seeks to know in order to inform action and one seeks to act in a manner which will be satisfactory but this in that initial account of the nature of knowledge and of the relation of knowledge to, to action and evaluation is merely introductory in character Lewis considers at some length problems of meaning and of analytic truth his objective was to establish the point that a priori statements statements is, whose truth is independent of matters of empirical fact are dependent for their truth value on meanings alone this involves the rejection of synthetic a priori statements for if a statement is synthetic and not analytic it cannot be a priori empirical synthetic statements on the other hand are true or false 
according to facts discoverable by sense experience, their truth values have no necessary connection with meaning and form. Since Lewis takes as his thesis the proposition that values are empirically knowable, it is relevant to his defense to consider whether other philosophers have been right to have said that the basic value and duty claims of ethics are synthetic a priori propositions. Book one then, following the two chapters of the introduction, is devoted to meaning and analytic truth. The following book considers the most important problems relating to empirical knowledge, the bases of empirical knowledge, the nature of empirical judgments and beliefs, the justification of empirical beliefs, probability and probable knowledge. This is a careful elaboration of the fundamental pragmatic thesis which relates empirical knowledge to predictions of sense experience. The concluding book, Book 3, presents an analysis of value making the familiar distinction between instrumental value and intrinsic value and building up to the unifying claim that questions of value are empirical questions. Lewis's account of value depends upon his basic assertion that values finally involve satisfaction, if not actually, at least potentially. Roughly speaking, something is valuable if it is such that under certain circumstances it will lead to someone's satisfaction. For a full understanding of various types of value judgments, one has to make distinctions of the sort Lewis clarifies. Distinction between the intrinsically good, the immediately good, the instrumentally good, and so forth. But for an understanding of the kind of defence possible for one who claims that values are empirically knowable, It is enough to realize that if value judgments can be expressed by hypothetical propositions, and if they relate to matters falling within the range of possible experience, then they are empirical judgments. To say that something is valuable is to say that if it were to have its effect on someone acting in regard to it, then it would satisfy or please him. It is possible to say even in regard to objects which are neither known to exist nor accessible to observers, to observation, that some of them are worth while in that were they to be discovered, they would in some way satisfy. Thus, and I quote, the term valuable is to be applied to objects and other existence solely with the meaning capable of conducing to satisfaction in some possible experience. To verify a value judgment then, one has only to determine whether the object in question does, under the circumstances, satisfy the person or persons to whom reference is implicitly or explicitly made. The immediate content of experience can be worthwhile in the sense that the experience may be prized for its own sake. Considering Lewis's argument in more detail, and turning back to the introduction, we find that Lewis considers the following criteria of knowledge to be suggested by common uses of the term knowledge. 1. Knowledge involves belief in what is true. 2. Knowledge involves meaning, a reference to some matter other than the experience of knowing. 3. Knowledge involves a ground or evidence. And four. Knowledge in the stricter sense is certain and not merely probable in some degree. However, if one were to define the term knowledge so as to include all these criteria, it would be difficult to find any instances of knowledge. A certain tolerance of the diversity of meanings and uses of the term knowledge is called for. Lewis decides to recognize three types of apprehension. Apprehension of directly given data of sense, such as particular feelings, aches, conscious responses to light and the like. Apprehension of the empirically verifiable and apprehension 
apprehension of what is involved in the meanings of terms. But of these three types of apprehension, only the latter two are called knowledge by Lewis. They are then empirical knowledge and the knowledge of meanings or logical knowledge, analytical knowledge. The apprehension of feelings, since it involves no claims and thus gains no recognition, the apprehension of feelings, since it involves no claims and, that, and thus gains no cognitive victories, is not called knowledge because the possibility of error is absent. The discussion of meaning and analytic truth begins with an account of the four modes of meaning. Denotation, the class of everything actual to which a term applies, Comprehension, the class of everything possible to which the term could apply. Signification, the property of anything in virtue of which the term applies. And intention, sometimes called connotation by other writers. The conjunction of all other terms applicable to anything to which the given term is correctly applicable. The most interesting and controversial claim made in connection with these distinctions is that the denotation of a propositional term such as Mary making pies now is the actual world characterized by the state of affairs described. Every statement attributes a state of affairs to the actual world. True statements denote the actual world False statements denote nothing. Since analytic statements are certifiable from, from facts of intentional meaning, and thus can be known to be true by knowing nothing more than the definitions of the terms involved, they require nothing of the world in order to be true. Lewis calls the intention of an analytic statement considered as a whole is holophrastic meaning. And since all analytic statements have zero intention, their holophrastic meaning of an analytic statement is its zero intention. For Lewis, the intention of a proposition is made up of whatever the proposition entails, since the analytic proposition entails nothing, it has zero intention. The analytic meaning of an analytic statement is its meaning, considered as a complex statement, that is, it is the meaning composed of the intentions of its terms. With this distinction, together with the distinction between implicitly analytic statements and explicitly analytic statements, Lewis is able to show that analytic statements are a priori since they can be known to be true by appeal to logic and to definitions. Since a priori truths are true independently of experience, they must be true by definition of terms they must be analytic. The classes are equivalent. The a priori is the analytic. Consequently, there are no synthetic a priori statements. Lewis does not accept the view that analytic truth merely expresses linguistic usage. The point is that once, meaning, once meanings are determined by use, the relationships of meanings are fixed and are not subject to linguistic stipulation. He maintains that language depends upon criteria for the applications of terms. The criteria are sense meanings understandable in advance of application in terms of if-then propositions having to do with the experiential consequences of action. The source of analytic knowledge is to be found in the relations between sense meanings. And I quote, 
such knowledge like the meanings in concrete I'll start again. Such knowledge like the meanings it concerns is essentially independent of linguistic formulation. End quote. Although all knowledge, whether of the analytic or of the synthetic, has reference to meanings, which are sense-representable, only empirical truth is such that one can acquire knowledge of it only through sense presentations. Analytic truths are known by the analysis of meanings, but synthetic or empirical truths are known only by the sense consequences of action. Lewis distinguishes three classes of empirical statements. Formulations of the given element in experience. Such statements are expressive and involve no judgments. Terminating judgments of the form sensory QS being given. If action A is undertaken, then experience E will occur. And non-terminating judgments, which present some state of affairs as being the case, such judgments having a significance which cannot be exhausted by any limited set of terminating judgments. Lewis argues that perceptual knowledge involves two phases. The giving, the giving of some sense datum or complex of data, qualia, and the interpretation of the given. Interpretation is a function of past experience and makes empirical belief or knowledge possible. If one expects a particular kind of experience to follow a particular kind of action, the perceptual judgment is terminating. If one states an objective state of affairs, the judgment is non-terminating, for there is no end to the ways in which, by action, one could confirm to some degree the objective claim. Objective beliefs, then, are never more than probably true. Along the way, there was an interesting discussion of the if-then relation in terminating judgments. The relation, Lewis claims, is neither material implication nor formal implication. In order to handle the question, in what sense can what is presently uncertain be called knowledge, Lewis considers the meaning of probability. The discussion is careful and involved, but its points are fairly clear. According to Lewis, probability theory, which attempts to make relative frequencies the final criterion of validity, is intrinsically circular. Not the frequencies themselves, but valid estimates of frequencies, based on data, are the essential factors in probability judgments. Passing on to a consideration of the justification of empirical judgments, Lewis argues that a body of empirical beliefs made up of beliefs which considered singly, are of little weight, may nevertheless have considerable weight of probability as a result of the consequence of the beliefs. Congruence is described as a relationship somewhat stronger than consistency, and in Lewis's epistemology, it takes precedence over coherency, the favourite of the idealists. And I quote, a set of statements, or a set of supposed facts asserted, will be said to be con congruent if and only if they are so related that the antecedent probability of any one of them will be increased if the remainder of the set can be assumed as given premises. If present memory can be trusted to afford some reason for counting on what is presumably remembered, and it is reasonable to assume that memory provides some evidential weight, then memory, together with the congruency of particular items of evidence, provides all that we need to make empirical knowledge of probabilities possible. The skeptic's reluctance to concede that the reliability of the objective world is a sign of 
the stultifying temperament with which Lewis had little sympathy. Lewis, Lewis's studies of meaning and empirical knowledge have prepared the way for the claims and arguments of Book 3, Valuation. And I quote, Evaluations are a form of empirical knowledge, he argues, and goes on to distinguish between direct findings of value qual quality and what is presented. The predictions of a goodness or badness which will be disclosed in experience under certain circumstances and on particular occasions, and the evaluations of things, appraisals of their potentialities for good or, or ill. The first, the direct findings of value quality in experience, does not involve judgment. An expression of value found in experience is true or false, since lying is possible, but no judgment is involved, since no predictions are made, and one simply finds that the quality of experiences is appealing or it is not. The, section, the second, the prediction that experience will have value if certain action is undertaken. If I touch what is before me, I shall enjoy it. Involves terminating judgments capable of verification and of being known to be true. The most frequent kind of evaluation is the third, ascribing value to objects and, as with any ascription of properties to objects, this form of judgment involves non-terminating judgments and is consequently never completely confirmable. But in regard to this third kind of evaluation, it is possible to acquire knowledge of probabilities and such judgments whether we know for certain that they are true or either true or false. For Lewis, then, the goodness of any good object consists in the possibility of its leading to some realisation of directly experienced goodness. The experience of goodness is simply the realisation of some experience as being such that one likes it or, as is often said, enjoys it. Immediately realised values are described by Lewis as subjective, when the prizing of the subject, the person, is a function more of his personality than it is of the quality of the experience. When the opposite is the case, the value is objective, even though it is the value of an experience. Immediate values are characterised as intrinsic. The values of objects are extrinsic or instrumental. When the object is such that in the presence of the object one realises the value quality of experience to which the object is conducive, the object is said to be inherently valuable. A beautiful object, for example, is inherent, has inherent value because in contemplation of it a pleasant experience is realised. The experience itself is immediately or intrinsically valuable. Developing his ideas of the aesthetic, Lewis argues that the object of aesthetic contemplation is what he calls the aesthetic essence, contingent upon context and not merely subjective, a complexus of properties forming some kind of configurational whole. In commenting on the moral sense of contributory, contributory values, Lewis suggests that the life which serves as the norm in the activity of moral choice is the good life, a life in which individual experiences contribute in virtue of their value quality to the worth of life as the whole. Choices made on the basis of probabilities and evidence as to the likelihood of achieving what one seeks through action is relative to past experiences as remembered. In the closing chapter, Value in Objects, Lewis stresses a point which his analysis of empirical knowledge makes clear. 
A value property, like other empirical properties, need not be realized in order to be something. Can we'll start again. A value property, like when a value property, like other empirical properties used. A value property, like other empirical properties, need not be realized in order to be something. <sighs> I'm confusing myself here with my own writing just a moment. I'll try again. A value property, like other empirical properties, need not be realized in order to be. That's what I meant. Something can be good in the sense that were it to affect someone, it would lead to satisfaction. He clears up various possible misconceptions. The fact that values are relative to circumstances and persons does not mean that they are subjective. The fact that a value is subjective does not entail that it is, gen that it is not genuine. The fact that something is of value to a person does not entail that it is objectively valuable, except as an object of his interest. And there are not simply one but several modes of value predication. The closing remarks makes the point that although determination of values is necessary to the application of ethical principles, it is not sufficient. Although valuation is always a matter of empirical knowledge, what is right and just can only be decided by reference to empirical facts alone. Lewis's presentation of important problems of meaning, knowledge and value is both clear and well, there may be something in it. Although he confines his attention to the empirical function of value terms, limiting his consideration of the expressive function to those occasions upon which one reports the value quality of experience as immediately prized, his analysis stands as a reasonable addition to the literature of value theory. The fact that an analysis of this sort is possible and is able to put up with a certain amount of criticism over the years can serve to support the claim that value utterances are not always and exclusively the emotive expressions of attitudes.